First, my disclosures, I am a partner physician at Spring Fertility and um, also uh, I'm receiving an honorarium for this talk. I have no other disclosures. Um, and what I wanted to share with you today was some rationale for something that I think is really important both for patients and for your practice. And that's to make sure that we're matching embryo DNA with parental DNA and parental support. Uh, and there's three hypothetical reasons that one might want to do this. One, uh, obviously, to look at origin of aneuploidy, does the error occur from the sperm or the egg? And how is this relevant to our patients? Uh, parental QC is another topic that uh, I think is very reassuring to patients knowing who give their gametes to the lab, knowing that the gametes that they gave to you actually did in fact uh, match to the DNA that uh, was tested for in their embryo. And then also one of the proposed uh, benefits is a genetic PN check. If your lab does not discard one PN or three PN uh, zygotes the next day, those uh, normalized cleave, one could be uh, confident that you do have biparental DNA in, in those embryos. But let's look at the first one on uh, parental source DNA and how this might be useful. There have been some recent studies uh, looking at many tens of thousands of sperm and trying to understand what is the incidence of aneuploidy in sperm DNA. And what's remarkable in these studies is whether they're using fish and looking at over 240,000 sperm samples or whether they're using a, a new uh, sequencing technique that they developed for individual sperm called SpermSeq. Uh, and they were able to test over 31,000 gametes. Both studies demonstrated an incidence of aneuploidy in the sperm that was about 1 to 4 percent. Most of the chromosomes were about 1 to 3 percent. That said, there have been two recent publications which revealed that 6 to 8 percent of the embryo biopsies being tested for sperm source or parental source identified a sperm-only source of the aneuploidy. So if you have a, a, a sperm aneuploidy rate of 2 to 3 percent, and embryo testing that's revealing parental, paternal only aneuploidy in either a monosomy or a trisomy of 6 to 8 percent, what is that difference about? And for a 43-year-old patient who's gone through multiple cycles to only to have all their aneuploid patients, if you do look at sperm source and parental QC and, and share that, it will not be uncommon in your practice. You'll have somebody who finds man, I finally had one embryo where all of the maternally inherited chromosomes were present in one copy each, and this time the sperm is messed up. And we all have to acknowledge that as wonderful as PGTA is, like any technology, it has its limitations. And there's a biologic limitation. We know about true mosaicism and mitotic errors that could occur. And we don't yet have a way to identify what might be a mitotic error or not. However, if you look at that difference, and if you say, well, 2 to 3 percent of all the sperm are aneuploid, why are embryos showing about 6 to 8 percent aneuploid derived from sperm? I think this is a really interesting question, and I think it begs uh, further research and perhaps some informed uh, studies and, and, and informed abnormal transfers of embryos that could be at high probability for mitotic errors. If you believe that half of those paternal only aneuploidies do represent mitotic errors, then there's a reasonable chance of a live birth. And for a 43-year-old person who only has one, or has only aneuploid embryos, and yet one of them only has sperm source DNA errors, this may very well be somebody who could be well counseled in a research setting to do an abnormal transfer. And if there's a 50% chance that that was a mitotic error, then we would expect to see um, you know, a live birth rate that could be as high as 30%. So could this help us identify some of the false positives in our PGTA? I think that really begs uh, further study. And the way that I would propose that we might do this would be to uh, engage patients who have donor egg derived embryos, lots of supernumerary embryos, and, and are completing their family building. And if they were able to donate abnormal embryos that just had paternal source aneuploidies, we could compare, we biopsy, and then also compare that with the inner cell mass and see if this is a potential opportunity to find false positives, uh, which we acknowledge are probably about 5% of the abnormal embryos. Trophectoderm to inner cell mass uh, concordance studies. 
So I think that's a meaningful benefit to the patient. How also might this help the clinic? And、um, it's not all about the science. And as there's increasing utilization in our space, we've also been hit with some very tragic stories recently. Some of these stories, I'm sure you've seen on the TV, whether it's ABC, NBC, Today's Show, Good Morning America, all these terrible stories about embryo mix-ups, gamete mix-ups, and they've been associated with significant、um, legal claims for the poor families who've been affected by this. So every lab、uh, takes multiple errors and should and should have two people signing off on every. Sperm and egg transition, and I'm sure that happens in all of our labs. It happens in every spring lab, and we have two eyes. Never have one person in the lab. Everybody always double checks.、Um, but there's another level of reassurance, both for your patients who are obviously anxious seeing these stories, and so it can be reassuring to your patients to know that、um, their DNA, which was taken before cycling, was used to pair against the embryonic DNA, and that that、uh, that all matched up. So I think that there's really value for patients who are feeling a lot of stress, having seen these stories, and they're probably asking that question. Every once in a while, a patient will make a joke to me, and I know behind every joke there's a lot of truth. About so, how do you know that's really going to be my sperm? And, and and I don't joke about that, and and I explain to them all of our processes where there's two people. They know that they can't drop off sperm without a photo ID. We check their photo ID at that time.、Um, And we take all, follow all of the best practices and, and, and never handle two patients' gametes at the same time on the same counter.、Um, so all that said, it adds a layer of reassurance for the patient. But I'd like to share another story that we didn't anticipate in a way that it really helped spring fertility、um, while we were trying to implement everything to the best of our abilities. And in this particular case, we had a couple with secondary infertility who came to our practice, actually wanted to do. Uh, IUI once, and unfortunately that didn't work. And then、uh, decided to go to IVF. And we do allow people to collect sperm at home.、Uh, when they bring it in, only the sperm source can bring it in, and they have to bring it in with a photo ID, as I'm sure all of your practices do. And in this case,、uh, we did that, and it, as was our practice,、um, we were using a genetic platform that required、uh, parental support. And, and support with、uh, parental DNA matching. And after we sent off about six embryos, we were able to find out a few,、uh, a few days later that the embryos were not matching with the、uh, sperm's DNA. So anybody who's worked in an IVF lab or an IVF clinic knows this is DEFCON four, and everybody stops what they're doing, freaks out. Oh my God! Check. Do we have IDs on everything? Did we double check everything? Was everything done? We have actually. Cameras in our labs too, so we can verify. Okay, people were paying attention, and we don't joke about that. So we verified that all of our paperwork were being done, was done correctly, and and at the same time we reached out to the patients, and we also wanted to confirm that they didn't have a bone marrow transplant, that the partner hadn't had a bone marrow transplant, which would have accounted for that、uh, mix-up as well.、Um, and, and in the course of that conversation with the patient, just to make sure that we didn't miss anything in his history where he'd had a bone marrow transplant.、Um, He answered some questions in a, a bit in an unusual format, and about 40 minutes later, he called us back. And what the patient revealed to us was that he and his wife had recently split up. I actually, we did a media case review. Lab procedures followed.、Uh, he did not have a bone marrow transplant. So, whose sperm was it, and where did it come from? And she was together with a new partner, and he had committed. To helping them get pregnant, and at first I thought, well, maybe this is a case of insurance fraud, right? Maybe they had insurance coverage, and he was the nicest ex-husband in the world, who was helping his ex-wife conceive with another person, so as to utilize their benefit.、Um, I, 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 to this day, we don't know why, right? Whether it was a social pressure, and it was somebody who was not born in the United States. And whether they didn't understand that they would be allowed, she would be allowed to potentially go through treatment with a, another man's、um, DNA, even though she was previously married.、Um, my suspicion is it was social pressures. But as we sort of tried to play this through, and I realized this was a, a self-pay patient. This was not somebody who was using、uh, this to have an insurance fraud. Another scary thing came to mind. What if we weren't using? Parental matching. 
And what if we weren't using paternal DNA? We would never have known that. She would have had euploid embryos, and we would have transferred that embryo. So it wasn't insurance fraud. But could it have been another form of fraud, particularly with the high-profile nature of these cases? So I can't imagine how we begin to compensate a couple in the case of a gamete mix-up. When a child goes and does 23 and Me later on in their life, the trauma to that family and that couple must be amazing. And I'm sure, and, and, and I'm not familiar with what these settlements are, but I'm sure that they're not small. But they've also been profiled on all of our major、uh, media outlets, and I don't think we would know about it if we weren't testing paternal and maternal DNA against the embryos. We immediately closed down sperm production at home, but in thinking about this, in this case, it wouldn't have prevented it, because the person producing the sperm and dropping off the sperm was a knowing participant and certainly could have brought sperm in their jacket, right, in another container, and substituted that sperm in the production room. So that wouldn't really protect against this. I can't imagine the day three years from now when somebody called and said, "I just did 23 and Me." And found out that my baby isn't genetically related to my husband. What I do know is, on that particular day, we had seven other egg, egg retrievals and seven other couples. And I don't see a way that we could have gotten to the bottom of this without having to reach out to those other couples and confirmed the genetic source of their embryos and that their children were attached. I can't, for the life of me, imagine what that would have done to the stress of those patients. Their experience waiting, the trust that they put in us, and the reputational damage to our center. There's absolutely mind blowing. And if we didn't check those embryos, there's no way we would have known that. And so I think we really have to operate that we are in an age where there are savvy patients, and the ability to present oneself as a couple. Even though there may be a real relationship in the background, substitute the sperm with your intended parent, and then present three years later. It may be worth it to some individuals to fake a marriage and fake a relationship in order to have a, a multi-million-dollar payout and, and facilitate raising your child. It's a scary thing, but you could see how it would happen: a sperm substitution, an IVF baby, 23 and Me, and we. Don't look for marriage records. We don't have PIs tracking our patients' home to confirm that those two people do in fact live together and that they are the intended parents. And and when that letter from an attorney shows up and says, "No, this patient, my client's baby, is not genetically related to her husband, and they were conceived at your clinic," I, I don't know how we would defend against this. So, it's my strong recommendation to all clinics, not only. For the potential to identify false positives, which is undetermined, for the potential to safeguard your patients from an embryo mix-up and having to go through a truly devastating life event, but also for the protection of your clinic in the event that there is、um, somebody fraudulently and, and, and intentionally substituting sperm,、uh, I think it would be a, a good idea for all of us to be taking advantage of parental source matching, parental QC. In any IVF case that we're doing that involves PGTA.